So we're here to look now, um, to look at um, the, some of the factors or some of the organizations or the supporting structures of the first intifada. And um, I'm not going to discuss here whether um, the question of violence or non-violence, but um, I'm going to give you an overview of the many fields in which the um, committees, uh, the various committees that existed in the occupied territories, in uh, the various fields in which they operated. Um, so first of all, um, I go back to the book that I have already mentioned, Mary King, The Quiet Revolution, um, and you can find most of the information that I'm relating here, you can find it in the book in a much more articulated way. Um, she mentions um, a number of influences that led to the mobilization um, into the of the 1980s into the First Intifada, and I've taken some of them and left uh, others, but uh, which I think are less relevant, um, but um, very much the scheme follows her work. Um, so let's start with uh, voluntary work committees. Uh, this, as, as you can see, these are, are most of the committees I'm going to talk about were established before the 1980s um, and are not connected to the question of violence or non-violence in the sense that when they were established, they were established as a tool of resistance but not uh, necessarily of direct confrontation. However, most of them were intended as a structure, structures that could support institution building in Palestine from various points of view. So the first uh, group is the voluntary work committees. These um, started in 1972 in the Ramallah Albire area, and they uh, were groups that met in libraries, groups that started with uh, cultural activities, um, in, the, in 1973 already, uh, there were various voluntary work committees in Nablus, in Jericho, in Hebron, and they planned uh, manual labor, building of roads, agricultural reclamation, helping farmers during harvest, um, all activities that they saw as, in, as necessary uh, to, um, to build a, sort of a Palestinian national character, if you like, even though I'm not sure whether this was theorized as such, certainly it was theorized as a means to resist um, the occupation. What is interesting and important to note is that um, they were mixed from a point of view, uh, like gender-wise, that uh, they emphasized manual labor as an valuable um, tool. And um, seven years later, in 1980, they, there was the establishment of a higher committee, <coughs> excuse me, a higher committee for voluntary work that coordinated 37 local committees um, and their uh, 1,200 members. So we're talking of something that between the 70s and 80s um, grew in numbers and in participants. Um, and um, again, the emphasis on, on manual labor um, was uh, important and it um, addressed a number of areas such as reclaiming the land, planting the trees, fixing the road that the occupation authorities um, did not um, take care of. Um, this was seen as a way, as a, as a means of resistance in a way because um, neglect could be a reason uh, invoked for to justify land confiscation by the Israeli authorities. So we have here a first group of committees, of voluntary committees, that addresses questions of work, land, uh, manual labor, and resistance. Let's move on to the second group. We're talking here of women's committees. Um, the first one to be established was the General Union of Palestinian Women, and there will be others in um, later years. Next week, um, we will uh, look through um, the history and the activities of some of these women's committees to see how the struggle of women uh, paralleled and complemented and maybe also offered different perspective to the struggle of um, the men and of everyone else. Um, the work uh, and the activities of the women 
women's committees focused on strengthening the women's role in the struggle against the occupation um, as a way to change both the nature of the role of women in Palestinian society and also that of the anti-occupation struggle in itself. So, um, of course, as we will see next week, those women's committees were varied and and they place different emphasis um, according to which political association, they, uh, political party they belong to, uh, sorry, they adhere to or they were sister to. But um, let's say that they all stressed, for now, let's say that they all stress the need for productive work, education, and vocational training for um, women. So as you can see already from these two uh, groups, um, we are talking of a transformative work uh, that starts from inside Palestinian society. We have point number three, university student movements. We are in the late 1970s. Um, Birzeit University is the backbone of student activism. And um, um, it's important to note that, um, st that student activism grew also because education grew exponentially among um, Palestinians and university educational education also, um, and also with the growth of, uh, of, of, of university um, itself. Uh, um, so there were two other universities that developed and were uh, transformed from previous colleges, uh, missionary colleges that existed. One was in Bethlehem, the other one in um, Nablus. But it's important to note that um, by 1987, there were about 16,000 um, Palestinians, uh, youths, and university students enrolled in seven Palestinian universities. Uh, as opposed to what was going on in the past, where uh, higher and university education was reserved or limited to and the elites, 70% um, of these 16,000 students now came from refugee camps, hamlets, villages, and small towns, changing the, not, not so much demography, but the, um, the, the cultural um, and political awareness um, and activism and engagement of the Palestinian um, population. So why was um, activism um, so vibrant in universities? Uh, as opposed to in other places? Well, first of all, because it usually is. Universities um, can be or have tended to be, especially in the 1970s, um, places of um, radical activism. And, um, and therefore, um, no, and, so, and also, activism was prompted uh, as, for example, in 1968 in many countries in Europe and not only in Europe, by the gap between the educational level reached and the lack of jobs in, uh, on the market. So, um, in a way, universities became crucial um, elements in the process of institution building um, centers where the effort of state building could be sustained. Um, so um, we are in a situation uh, whereby, um, if we look right at these three groups of um, committees and, and student movements, um, th th there are a number of factors which speak about a process of institution building. And remember that in 1982, the PLO uh, relocated in Tunis, and as I mentioned already, it was going further away um, from uh, geographically, but also politically, from what was going on in the occupied territories from the original uh, Palestine. Let's go on to the fourth um, group, although I'm realizing here that there is a mistake in numbering. So um, count it as, as three because it's together with university students, it's youth committees, so it's part of the same age group. Uh, but um, we have here a, a very different kind of um, organization. Um, this is very important for what will go on during the Intifada later on. This is a movement called Ashabiba, uh, the young people. And this was um, established in 1980, so later, much later than um, university committees. First of all, in the Anabta refugee camp near Tukarem. Um, and then this idea of having youth committees uh, spread to other 
um, uh, camps. Um, these were protest activities um, and uh, against the, 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 the Israeli army. Uh, it's important to note that there were separate branches for men and women, but also that in 1987, the youth committees inside the camps are declared illegal by the um, um, Israeli authorities. Uh, many of these uh, young people would end um, up in jail, therefore a prisoner movement, uh, movement develop, and um, they managed to coordinate collective actions in each jail uh, that would go from making noise, uh, making their voice heard. Um, it, it was rather, as Mary King describes this, the, these uh, organizations, it was quite a remarkable a spontaneous network that grew in, um, in, in every uh, jail. For example, hunger strikes was uh, one of the activities of the, um, of the prisoners, um, which was uh, a way to protest and also sustain popular dissent. And finally, we have um, medical committees, which are an extremely important and interesting uh, section of, um, of, um, of this network of organizations. Um, there were medical relief committees, which, became, which, which in the late 1970s already began to operate under the mantle of the Union of the Palestinian Mal Medical Relief Committees. Um, now, all these... Um, Actually, six influences that I've mentioned will, pray, will play a very relevant and very important part um, for supporting and sustaining the Intifada um, as a means of, uh, as a revolt, first of all, as a means of, um, as an active means of protesting the um, occupation and of gaining the confidence and of being able to confront uh, an, um, an army uh, an occupying army like the um, Israeli Defense Forces. So um, I will now, um, before moving on to the slides on um, on a discussion whether the, the first Intifada was actually violent or nonviolent, um, I would like to mention here that this network of committees responds to um, one of the um, most important uh, characteristics of civil society, that is horizontal networks of participation uh, for um, transforming the political reality. So, um, as you can see, I'm insisting on this point, but I really think that it's a parallel that we find both among Palestinians and um, and uh, among Israeli activists, so I think it's worth stressing it. So let's go um, on to the first intifada and let's uh, have a look at the discussion whether it can be considered violent or non-violent and um, where we can place ourselves in this debate. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>